Hi, welcome. My name is Lyle Murphy. I'm the founder of the Alternative to Med Center. And today we're going to be talking about Prozac. Um, we have some questions that we're going to answer and try to help gain a deeper understanding of really how Prozac works, especially when considering withdrawing from Prozac. Um, first question is, what is Prozac? Well, Prozac is, is been around a while. It's an SSRI which means that it is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It's also known as fluoxetine. Um, now, how an SSRI works, um, just for sort of the quasi layman's scientific terms, is um, there's, a, there's a process in the synapse where um, serotonin itself is, is meant to be inhibitory. It's meant to make it harder for this nerve to talk to this nerve. This nerve is the side of the nerve that has the serotonin in it. And this is the side that has the receptors in it. So if you can imagine, you have a stack of these through the nervous system, where if you have something of an impulse that comes up from your brainstem or other places saying, hey, this is a threat, or this is something I should worry about, or this is like, oh my God, it has the ability to sort of soften that approach. Serotonin in and of itself is not what you would consider a mood elevator. When people talk antidepressant, I think of something that elevates their mood. It's not a dopamine-based chemical or drug. It is a serotonin-based. So serotonin is an inhibitor, and it inhibits largely impulsive thinking, the type of fight-or-flight thinking that leads to anxiety. And also, since serotonin, uh, it's, it's part of it, a very small fraction of it, in the brain will go on to form melatonin, and melatonin is your sleep neurohormone. Um, as a side note, you can't just take melatonin and have it cross the blood-brain barrier. It has to, <laughs> melatonin would have to be broken down in your gut into um, tryptophan, which the tryptophan would form 5-HTP, and that could cross the blood-brain barrier, and then form serotonin and melatonin. So unfortunately, for those people who are just having sleep problems, um, melatonin, still has to go through some um, metabolic um, transformations to actually get into your brain in the first place. So um, anyway, back to serotonin, how it works and how Prozac works. So it's defined as a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Uh, what that really means is that, uh, well, what it's believed to really mean, I wanna, I wanna have some ambiguity there because I don't know that anyone, including me, really, really knows, but what it's believed to do is when the serotonin is released, it binds to these receptors over here. It creates an inhibitory response. In other words, it makes it harder for this nerve to transmit the nerve impulse that was coming from this one. It actually um, makes it less likely there's gonna be nerve depolarization. So it's called a neuromodulator. Then when it's done, it lets go um, because of an enzy enzyme called serotoninase, and it can be reuptaken back into the originating vesicles and used again. So it's like a game of catch. I throw you a ball, you throw it back. I throw you a ball, I throw it back. Well, what the drug does theoretically is it causes the serotonin, it's basically poisoning the serotoninase enzyme. So it stays stuck here. So it's like, I throw you the ball, and you don't ever throw it back. Then I'm looking for another ball to throw, and I don't have one. And eventually, because this recycling process is not happening, um, the, the the serotonin will stay out there in the synapse and then it'll degrade down into its metabolites, which means it's no longer serotonin. So it, it sort of denatures out there and will not work anymore. So the drug is not making serotonin. It's spending what you have. So even though it has a uh, initial potent effect, it may or may not keep that potent effect, just like most drugs, you may... um in some sense, downregulate to the effect of the drug. And that downregulation may look like you've just spent up the little bit of serotonin that you had if it was a serotonin deficiency in the first place, um, which <laughs> there's no lab test, unfortunately, that can tell us what, um, what the chemical state of your brain is unless you, well, there is, but you can only do it one time. You have to take the brain out and put it into a blender, which is what they do with animals and rats and stuff to know their neurochemical state. But that's not obviously going to work in a therapeutic sense when treating humans because, um, like I said, you only get to do that one one time and um, it wouldn't be uh, ending someone's depression in the right way. 
So um, another thing that happens with um, with um, antidepressants sometimes is is it is <laughs> when we hear about these school shootings, when we hear about how um, people have done tragic things to a family member, uh, you know, killed a father or killed a child or something, and then they wake up in jail and they don't even realize what happened. Um, there seems to be a certain uh, segment of the population that may get disinhibited from these sort of medications and go into a dreamlike state where um, they truly um, acted very different than what their normative state would be. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of empathy in my heart for some of those people because I have talked to um, people who have um, done time in prison and have told me their situation. I was out at a conference one time and this man who, I mean, I don't get thrown off very easily, but this man was one of the, um, he had his, his um, sort of a um, group that he was running to help parents understand uh, the dangers of these drugs because he had murdered his son um, on uh, an antidepressant. And he woke up in jail and didn't even know what had happened. And he'd always loved his son. And um, after he did his time, he chose to be a bit of a champion of the the ill effects of some of these medications. And I was, um, I was flabbergasted. I, I mean, I was just truly shocked and, um, it was hard for me to even maintain myself in the conversation because, uh, that's a pretty heavy thing to have to carry. <laughs> and I, and I, I can't imagine what this man had to endure for those many years, um, feeling, uh, the pain of what had happened there. So, um, anyway, what is, uh, the next question is what is Prozac prescribed for? Well, Prozac has a bit of a, um, a robust uh, list of things that it's prescribed for. Some antidepressants are more narrow than that, but Prozac's been around a while. Um, aside from just straight depression, it's also used um, for um, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, uh, bulimia at times, um, uh, menstrual uh, uh, problems. Um, and um, since serotonin is largely you know, ninety percent of the serotonin or more is actually utilized in the gut rather than the brain. Um, there are definitely some effects that happen in the um, enteric or the um, or the um, you know part of your gut that uh, is using the most of your serotonin. So uh, sometimes it gets prescribed for digestive sort of things as well. Uh, question number three: Is Prozac different than other SSRIs? Um, yes. Largely, yes. Um, of course, they're all different. That's how they're patented differently. But the effect of, of, of Prozac is, is it's a very long-acting drug. So it could take three to five days for half of it to leave your system. So um, that's what makes it pretty much the um, a unique in a certain fashion, is that it is the longest half-life um, uh, antidepressant that I'm aware of. Um, question number four. Is Prozac an effective bridge medication uh, to help you get off of other um, antidepressants? It can be. I mean, it depends on the person. People have uh, the, the genomics testing sometimes that tell you um, which medications you may be tolerable to and which ones you can't. Um, you know, sometimes those tests are, you know, again, genetic testing even is not that like it's not crystal clear. It doesn't make things crystal clear. It gives you some um, genetic testing for me is largely a um, probabilities that tells you what might happen if certain other things like it's kind of like the genetic testing is sort of like a like a looking at a map of a city and trying to determine where the traffic's going to be. Um, you see smaller roads and you see bigger roads. And if you imagine you put traffic on there, where the bottlenecks are going to be. But you don't really know until you put the traffic on the road where the bottlenecks are going to be. And you might be surprised. Things might be just fine in certain places and things may not be. But um, uh, different antidepressants definitely have different effects on people's genetics. So um, I can't qualify that as saying, yes, it is an effective bridge for everyone. But uh, if a person's on an SNRI, which SNRIs or other medications that have both a serotonin and a dopamine or norepinephrine effect, so you've got basically two different neurochemicals that are sort of falling from the sky at the same time, if you're doing a, a withdrawal, 
Prozac could be a bridge to um, stop the serotonin part of it so that the norepinephrine part can, can start to re-regulate again. And usually if you stop the serotonin part and you don't stop the norepinephrine part, it looks like the depression, you know, you get a, um, a significant amount of depression, but you generally spared like the brain zaps and the a huge problems sleeping and all that out at the same time. So you can work with the uh, lethargy and then not feeling well while you're, while you're having, um, the serotonin symptoms are generally more um, concerning as far as like physiologically. Um, of course, depression, hardcore depression that happens like that is no joke. It can be the thing that has someone um, take their life. Um, so always a slow, careful tapering is, um, is the most pragmatic thing. But sometimes inserting Prozac in while you're coming off another antidepressant can be um, a bridge strategy, especially for those people that are stuck. And one of the reasons why is that because Prozac has such a long half-life, it almost has a natural taper built into it. So if it takes five days for it to clear your system, um, the real problem with withdrawal for many people is the speed at which the medication leaves your system. So the reason why people can die from an alcohol withdrawal is um, because of how alcohol inhibits certain things that can, uh, like a calcium channel blocker that can result in seizures, but it also is because it leaves your system so fast. Like you clear the alcohol so fast that you go into withdrawal. Um, Effexor is another antidepressant that, that is quick. I mean, it can leave your system fast. So sometimes Prozac can be um, an intermediary step to get people through that sort of stuff, but it is truly based upon you. And um, if you're struggling with um, some other antidepressant uh, getting off of it and you're considering is Prozac a better option, for a short-term period of time, that might be something you would bring up with your prescriber, um, and hopefully they have some experience with that. Um, question number three, or excuse me, question number five, what are natural Prozac alternatives? Um, right now we're sitting at number one for Prozac alternatives, and the, that means with Google that you have this snippet. Um, and they choose a snippet. I mean, you can tell them like, hey, I want this thing to show up, but they don't always do that. Well, what Google has been choosing more and more for our snippets or anyone's snippets are these bullet points. So they find a place in our article that has bullet points. Like what are the natural serotonin, you know, natural um, Prozac alternatives? And it'll just kind of bullet point what those things are. And um, that doesn't necessarily work for, but it doesn't work in real time. So what works in real time is, is discovering what, who you are, what is the real um, fabric of what's going on. I mean, some people, they're not happy with their life. Some people have are surrounded by jerks, but they just need to get out of their life. Some people are eating inflammatory foods that cause brainstem inflammation. Some people um, are don't have enough protein in the food choices that they're having, and they're eating too much sugar, and they're on this hypoglycemic roller coaster that wears out their serotonin. Um, for some people, it can be a thyroid problem. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why a person can be depressed. And it's it's not just serotonin based for most people. Uh, that the whole concept of, I believe behind uh, the drugs like Prozac was to just keep somebody from committing suicide. I mean, if you can, if you can raise a person's serotonin levels, uh, you can put a bit of an interrupt between them uh, having the I feel like I should die and actually doing something about it. So um, there is that. Um, but as far as the sustainability and these drugs don't make serotonin, they're spending it. So what specifically makes serotonin is um, the, the immediate precursor is tryptophan. Um, so tryptophan is an amino acid. You probably know it from hearing about turkey and Thanksgiving dinners. Uh, it is found in poultry um, in higher concentrations. And it also is found in avocados, bananas, and other things. So um, tryptophan is a naturally occurring amino acid, which will form serotonin once it crosses the blood-brain barrier. 5-HTP uh, is also um, in that same pathway. And 5-HTP is sort of what, there's tryptophan forms 5-HTP, and then the 5-HTP will form serotonin. Um, so those are the natural replacements for um, serotonin. And, um, um, another thing that helps back that up a little bit is a little, little bit of niacin because if you have, if you've been eating a lot of sugar, which honestly happens with people who are sort of self-medicating the serotonin thing, there's a reason why the insulin 
um, the insulin dump will cause some um, short-term boost in serotonin. Um, it's spending it again, and after a couple hours, when the insulin drops back down, then all the excitatory amino acids besides tryptophan come out and cause this roller coastering. But still, people will self-medicate with sugar. Um, um, it's these are the same folks that are going to have energy metabolism problems. So uh, sugar itself uses up your B, B vitamins. So what I'm saying here is if you don't have enough niacin in your system to do energy metabolism, then the tryptophan can degrade into niacin. So you boost it with the niacin and the tryptophan to form 5-HTP. Um, and then form serotonin. Okay, question number six. What helps with Prozac tapering? Um, well, one thing that helps with it is Prozac is, uh, has a long half-life, so it kind of almost has a natural tapering in it. But um, what we do here is we will um, buffer somebody up with the natural alternatives. Not just the tryptophan and the 5-HTP, but other things as well. I mean, there's um, a lot of um, inhibitory sort of uh, amino acids that form inhibitory neurochemicals. There's GABA, there's theanine, there's taurine, there's, you know, there's um, inositol, there's things that um, can be used in conjunction. But primarily, we are boosting the inhibitory pathways up, um, getting them ready for the first couple of weeks so that they can endure when they're coming off the drug. So they're not going into a serotonin plunge. Um, this strategy is only meant for withdrawal. It is not meant for a long-term solution because in the literature, um, I have never seen a case of this in 15 years. I've um, heard a couple people in the 20,000 phone calls I've had um, talk about that they had this serotonin syndrome and they ended up in the hospital. Um, those folks were on multiple antidepressants and that was the cause. But in theory um, and in the literature, you could get too much of a good thing here. So if you're taking an antidepressant and you're taking tryptophan together, um, one is going to be feeding your serotonin pathway and one is going to be preventing the breakdown of it. So you could get a spike in serotonin that could be um, fatal. There is a syndrome called serotonin syndrome that can be very, it's like, um, it's like taking too much of a barbiturate or something. It can cause some um, um, depression of your, of your breathing and increase in your heart rate. I mean, it's, it, it, it's not something that would happen in a short period of time, I believe. Um, um, the, 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 the reason why we do it is because again, we're taking away one while we're putting away in the other. So they don't have a chance to double down. Um, I'm telling you this because if, um, if for some reason you try this out there on your own, um, you uh, need to know this. And um, on that note, uh, anything you're actually hearing from me is based upon things that we've experienced with our inpatient population. Uh, we don't have a therapeutic or a medical relationship with you. Everyone is biochemically unique and needs to be um, viewed through that lens and needs to go through the investigative process of having a real doctor-patient interaction. And this is not a replacement for that. So do not take anything that we're telling you here to be medical advice. Use it as information to maybe present to your medical provider and get their sort of input on it. But don't go taking off on some of these things and changing your medications and stuff without some sort of support. Um, you can get our support uh, in an inpatient setting here if you choose. And um, you can contact the numbers on this page. Or you can also um, subscribe to our channel, in which case you'll be getting um, these videos uh, um, more often sent to you, and um, you can run these sorts of things by your prescriber. I want to thank you so much for listening and um, um, being with me here either today or tonight. And um, I wish you well in your journey, and thank you very much.